Well, it's my great uh, privilege, honor uh, to introduce you to Sergei Popovich, uh, who is a very old friend. Um, uh, we're both not as young as we once were. None of us are, I guess. But uh, back in the day, uh, Sergio was working on this small problem in his country, Serbia, where uh, the country was dominated by a guy by the name of Milosevic, you may have heard of, uh, who uh, was waging war all around him, was uh, suppressing and repressing and oppressing uh, the people, uh, his own people. And there was very little in the way of anyone to stand up uh, to him. And Sergio and a few others very bravely uh, figured out a way to use humor uh, and to use uh, the sense of being everywhere all at once to change completely the perception of the society uh, of having no room to maneuver to making it seem almost inevitable that Milosevic would go. And it was just amazing to watch. And I was living and working in Central and Eastern Europe at the time uh, where people like Milosevic and Tujman and Mechiar and a number of these uh, fun individuals uh, were, were uh, wreaking their havoc uh, on Central and Eastern Europe. And we've come a long way in many respects, and in some respects still have a long way to go. But in any case, um, Sergio was one of the founders of this movement. And the, f the movement was called Otpor, and Otpor means resistance, and it had, its symbol was a raised fist. And one of the things that, uh, I'm sure he'll tell you more about this, but one of the things that when I was working with him and some of his friends back in the day, it's so creative. And so I, I'm really looking forward to you being able to hear from him some of these ideas that he has to share based on a long experience. Because after Milosevic fell, he went into parliament for a little bit uh, and, and decided at the end of the day that his skill set and his passion really lay in sharing the tactics and techniques that he had learned while he was uh, underground in, in Serbia and how to perhaps share those ta tactics, nonviolent tactics and techniques, by the way, nonviolent, uh, with the rest of the world. So he and some friends of his uh, put together something called Canvas, the Center for Applied Nonviolent uh, uh, Action Strategies. So he's going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, my own recollection, uh, a couple of things I just wanted to share from that time, was the idea of small stickers. Right? It's one of the things that it was like thumb size, maybe even smaller, uh, that had the Otpur symbol on them. And what you would do with these is you would just you'd pass them out to lots of people, and they would put them anywhere. So you'd be on a bus, holding onto the bus, the rail, and you'd just like put your sticker there. And all of a sudden, all over the city, in Belgrade, there were these stickers everywhere for Odpor. Like, how did they get there? And the regime would go crazy. And I think it was the first time the tactic was used that I've advanced all over the place, is they, they had these little stamps uh, where they would stamp the currency <laughs> with the Odpor sticker, and it would circulate. <laughs> and the government would try to take it out of circulation, but it would be too late, and there was nothing they could do, and Odpor was everywhere until Otpor finally was everywhere. Uh, there were 70,000 supporters, people came out in the streets, and Milosevic fell without a shot. Uh, and that was what was most miraculous. So we're gonna, I'm going to turn it over to Sergio to talk to you a little bit about his personal story, uh, and then about the book, how the book came about. Uh, and then I'm going to ask a few questions, and I'm going to invite you uh, to participate as well and ask a few questions. So over to you, Sergio. Oh. Welcome again. Great to see an old friend in a, in a new, new suit. Congratulations for working with Google Ideas. Thank you. Um, I'm very familiar with the work of Google Ideas. I'm so proud to know people like Jared Coyne or Dan Kesslering, who is hiding here in the, in the front rank. And so happy to be with you guys and met some of your colleagues on events like Zeitgeist. And I'm very, very enthusiastic about the fact that you're putting at least the part of your resources into making the world more, better and, and more open place. Now a little bit about, about, about this story and this little yellow thing which sits in your, in your chairs. Uh, I'll start by a story of me, and this is not a book about me. I would never write one. I would never even read one. <laughs> it will be the boring one. But it's a, it's a story of a, of a rock kid. I started as a bass guitar player in a Serbian rock band, and 
I was thinking that activism is for geeks and people who are fighting for animal rights and stuff like that. But being thrown into the warland and understanding that the only way to do something is, is to change, and specifically being thrown into this through the very, very interesting student movement, which has its uh, cultural component, subcultural component, rock and roll component, designing component, arty component, catchy component, funny component, in component, cool component. I ended up in a society where you, you know, you can't date in Serbia if you're not a part of student movement. <laughs> now, you know, it really shifts your reality into something which is completely different. And uh, one of the things the book will tell you about, and you will read it on the subway, it's really, really, really easy read. And it was made for the people who are not experts, who are not activists per se, but do understand the story. How many of you have seen The Lord of the Rings? This movie, yes. <laughs> You're a Google man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, remember, you remember Hobbits. And you know what? So what, one of the funny thing about it is that these creatures, little hairy, super thrilled about eating and smoking pot and you know living in their <laughs> little holes and they're not really designed for change i mean they're not wearing the shiny armors they're not wizards but they are the one who get the part in the history to perform the change and this is the book of little hobbits and where you look at the egypt my friend muhammad adel you want to look at the Martin Luther king the guy was a village priest harvey milk camera shop owner who are these people wizards Knights? No, hobbits. And wherever you look at the world, it is the small hobbits shaking and shaping. So this, when I say the story of me, this is a story of the very, very common and ordinary people, some of them who live in your neighborhood who made a dramatic change. And whenever you look, you will find a really, really cool examples. This is not only about the Serbia. This is about the fantastic people who shake the Israeli state around the idea of the cottage cheese. This is the story of the people who put up the toy protest in, in February 2011 in Siberia, making Putin look completely ridiculous. This is the story of very, very many people, people like you and me, who came out to this understanding that they should change the world. Now, the second part of the book is the story of us. Now, how big part of your history book is related to wars? Have you ever thought about it? You take your history book, how much of it is war? How many movies have you watched about the Vietnam? One stupid proxy, completely unimportant war in the history, but you've probably seen like five, six, seven, ten DVDs. How many cool movies about Martin Luther King? One. How many good movies about Gandhi? One. One cool about the Harry Milk. So when you look at your non-violent struggle DVD collection, it's probably <laughs> three inches. And uh, why so? Because if you look in the world we are living at, the things which were driving the big wars of past in terms of uh, First World War, Second World War, I mean, who is remembering the Second World War ideologies? Would we really go out and kill each other because we are communists or not? This is really doesn't matter. But when you look in a world where President of the United States is a black person, you can see the consequence of something starting by Martin Luther King. When you look in a world where even the Republican candidate will stay, stand for gay marriage, probably on the next American elections, you're looking at the world where Little Hobbit, Harvey Milk, was successful. So you are living in a world shaped by nonviolent struggle, but in a bizarre way, you know far more about the heroes of the past. I mean, look at the monuments in New York or Washington, D.C. They're all tall, armed men on horse. <laughs> this is, and, and then you find a little Gandhi. There is one Gandhi monument here in New York. And I don't know how many of you do know where the Gandhi is in New York? Ah, tiny, tiny. You need to practice. <laughs> okay, Google. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the story. The story of the story of us is that we are living in a world where we really need to learn more about how important that this social change is and how we can boost it. And now we are looking at the story of now. And we are looking at the world where you turn the news on, you see the Hong Kong and the Egypt and this and that. It's like wherever you look on the TV, you have a super excited TV anchor who says, oh, this spontaneous demonstration just occurs. There are two types of protest movements of this world. They are either spontaneous or successful. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make them successful, 
you need to look at the vision and strategy and tactics and build unity and build from small victories. And I think the reason why we made this book is that this knowledge is out there and we really wanted to put it in a cool form for the common people to understand that what shapes this world is A, coming from hobbits, B, this is something you can and should do at home. Not all of you have Milosevic at home, but you may have a bully neighbor, you may have a very bad school district, you may have a dog's poop on the street, depending on the part of the town you're living, you may have a very, very corrupted public official, who is the reason why your public transportation sucks or whatsoever. And this is not limited to democracies or autocracies. This is like everywhere. And if we understand that there is a set of tools we can apply, and if we join our forces, I mean, we are working now and making this available as a short animated videos. We would like to work more with Googles of this world to make this available to more of people, with Wikimedia of this world. We are teaching this thing on Harvard and NYU. We'll have an online course where, which is going to become available for the people across the world how to build this movement. Because what I think is that next year will be, next, next century will be the century of knowledge race. It's not the arms race anymore. It doesn't really matter who have tanks. Nobody will dare to use tanks. Or if they use tanks, they will end up like US in Iraq or Putin in Donbas, like stuck. It's not going to perform the real social change. And I think uh, at the end of the day, and the last chapter of the book is called, it has to be you. So we need to understand that this is our little role to take a little injustice, fight it. And yes, we are, however, we are looking as hobbits and we are lazy and hairy and laid back. It is our part to change our little path of the world. And to end up quoting Tolkien once again, the, the grand lesson of this book is that Yes, even the smallest creature can change the destiny of the world. And throughout the history, it has been like that many, many times. Thank you, Sergio. That's really powerful. Um, where I wanted to dig in is to actually go back in time first uh, to October uh, 2000 when the, the campaign came, kind of came to its victorious end. Uh, and it really did happen with very little violence. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think it didn't involve much violence? Mm, because people were trained to be nonviolent. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the one of the things we need to understand is that A, uh, violence looks sexy. And you know, the person with the gun is the favorite person of your DVD collection. Okay, it's always Die Hard and Die Hard with Vengeance and Die Hard 7 if it's not a Terminator, but this is the guy with the gun comes in and solves the problem. Uh, you look at the nonviolent struggle and you actually understand it is more effective. And there is a scientific study shows that in the last century there were like 323 different campaigns and nonviolent campaigns were twice more effective. And this is not just the better moral choice, it's about you look at this and say if I want to succeed I will use the most effective weapon. And when you look at the Serbian campaign or you look at any campaign throughout the world, uh, nonviolent uh, discipline is one of the three principles of success together with unity and planning. How do you get there? It is the great question. And it's a skill. You can teach people this skill. Uh, a, you can preach it, whether as a religion or ideology or a cool, non-cool factor, because it's like in Serbia and wars with all of this past, this violent guys were not super sexy. It was actually the nonviolent guys who were looking more like the cool. And then the second one, you train your troops to be nonviolent. You sit when you see the police. You make the live chain between you and the police force. So you make sure that you know, there won't be one drunk idiot who throw rocks. And by the way, you look at it from the position of tomorrow's newspaper and you can have 10,000 people on the peaceful march singing and have three drunk idiots start throwing molotovs and guess who is on the cover page of the New York Times? Mm -hmm. These three guys, always. The media, you can count that the media would be super violent thirsty and that they will send only the message you don't want them to send. So last but not of least importance, you don't want to align with the groups who are potentially violent and this is also one of the tricks. And if you perform the large-scale demonstrations, there will be black blocks of this world ready to come in and start throwing stones and breaking windows. They love this. They live for this. 
soccer fans in Serbia, they just started looking at the opportunity <laughs> to attack the police. And, and it's, it's like that everywhere. But it's your duty to cooperate with the, with the police force in this, in this case. So it took us 10 years to evolve when we see the police force ready to beat us. Like in 991, 992, we would howl. Normally, we would do up, 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 which is you know telling the police people that they are no better than the dogs. But then we evolve into the position where we're giving them the flowers and the cakes and the beautiful girls would be in the front ranks. <laughs> And this is the beauty of nonviolent struggle is to understand that if you want to change things, you need to pull, not push. And this pull versus push thing is the great evolution which brings you to the successful nonviolent struggle. Well, I, I want to get into technology in a bit, but a couple more questions about this. Mm. I think that as we, as we see uh, the pain and dislocation and violence in Syria, uh -huh. where uh, the movement started as a peaceful, nonviolent uh, movement and continued, even after some uh, fighting began to break out. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what do you think of that whole situation? Was, was it possible to maintain mm -hmm. uh, nonviolent tactics in the face of that kind of violence? Uh, we, there is a whole chapter where we are discussing this with a Syrian group mm -hmm. in the book. And actually, that was the moment when they were getting people from what it became later, the Free Syrian Army. And they were super inspired with this idea, oh, we need to make the hub for the people in uniform so they protect us if somebody shoots at us. Uh, of course, it was, it was possible to fight Assad by nonviolent means. And when you look at the first seven months of Syrian uprising, you can look at the great numbers, relatively nonviolent demonstrations, a lot of victims, but number of victims on the side of the, of the protesters actually grow when they took arms. And this is the rule. So when you're looking at this, you can look at this from the point of strategy first mm -hmm. and say, okay, uh, I'm looking at this guy and his name is Assad and he sits on, uh, on 100,000 strong military. And can I imagine the, the alternative to this guy? And he's going to be Mike Tyson. How many of you are familiar with the name Mike Tyson? <laughs> okay, my question is, if you need to win over the Mike Tyson, is the boxing ring place that you're going to pick? <laughs> no. He's going to eat your ears. <laughs> He's going to eat your head in 15 minutes. And of course you would like to challenge him on the game of Scrabble, the game of chess, <laughs> and this is where you have a certain advantage. So avoiding the strong points of your opponent and looking at his weak points is a, is a military doctrine of Sun Tzu, which is like 3,000 years old. So when you're looking at the Assad, the last place of the world you want to challenge him is the field of military. The guy has a superior military. You look at his wallet, he's broke. You want to really challenge Assad, you will look at the tactics of non-cooperation. You will look at a successful example in the past where we have a non-violent struggle against the apartheid regime in South Africa and then the genial people came in and said, let's make the spear of the nation and start throwing bombs. And then, of course, Mandela got to jail and they got stuck for like 15 years. And then in the last stage of the struggle, they say, okay, this is the situation. We have internationally isolated regime, which needs to fund a very, very expensive oppression. How the hell they are filling the budget? And they're looking at the budget and they understand that it is actually the majority of the black people of South Africa are buying goods from few South African companies who are paying taxes, which is effectively funding military. So by buying this and by buying that, they're funding the oppression. They say, okay, we won't buy. That's how we are going to solve this problem. And Peter Botter regime in South Africa was economically collapsed. It was not militarily collapsed. It was still one of the healthiest military on the African continent, but it was economically collapsed. So the, the case in, in this type of the situation is that you're looking at, at the vulnerabilities of your opponent. Uh, the real problem with Syrians was also very, very different. And I think that's one of the, of the grand lessons of Arab Spring. I think the real problem was that they really were inspired to go in arms to what happened in Libya. So now we have a military, we have a nonviolent uprising in Libya, which turned into the military uprising, which ended up with foreign military intervention with Gaddafi killed and raped on the street. And then the Syrians took it from there and said, okay, we would like to see Assad raped and killed on the street. But guess what? Look at the Libya now. 
Would you like this scenario to have at home? No. Only 4% of military uprising end up in stable democracy. This is not because I'm preaching nonviolence and, and I'm having a little tattoo of Gandhi <laughs> on my left hand. This is because a lot of people participate in nonviolent struggle, as opposed to the small group of people participate in a violent struggle. And it's also the kids phenomenon. If you teach kid that the only way to change the government is to kill the president, what do you think the kid will do next time? They will try to kill the president. If you teach people that widely popular nonviolent movement, which mobilizes the people throughout the election, is the way to change government, like we did in Serbia, how do you think we are changing governments now? On the elections. Why do you think they are not stealing the elections? Because they know that there is a price tag. Mm -hmm. So this is like, you know, it's a learning curve. Let me ask you uh, another question that's in the news these days, and that is the, the evolution of Putin's strategy in Ukraine. And I know a lot of uh, Central Europeans and Baltic states are really nervous about the approach they're taking because it's so subtle mm -hmm. uh, and so not so subtle at the same time. Um, how, how to respond in um, nonviolent ways there? And kind of related is, I know that you're friends with a lot of the folks in Pussy Riot and some of the other uh, Russian activists, but that space has shrunk so, so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and these two things are related. Uh, the Putin and other regimes have really learned a lot over the last uh, 10 years or so, mm -hmm. uh, and they're applying their own tactics. So how do we respond? Well, it's a multi-layer question. First, I think the, the Ukrainian crisis matter, and not only because it was in media, but because it is a very important breaking point of, of uh, power balance in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And it also made Putin very nervous, because I think the reason why he's doing what he's doing is that he's looking at the Maidan, which is a central square in Kiev, Ukraine, and he's imagining the similar situation in Moscow. And I think that grows him uh, a growingly nervous. Uh, when you look at these at these struggles, you can also look a uh, learning curve. And one of the books that tells a great story about it, it's written by my very, very good friend, Will Dobson. It's called Dictator Learning Curve. And he explains how dictators find a way to prevent these nonviolent revolutions before they occur. So they will squeeze the media space, they will censor the internet, they will make the bans on people gathering together. And it's a kind of the learning race. And wherever you speak with the, with the clever guys, and we are, we are proud to have people from Human Rights Foundation here in the audience who are making this great big Oslo Freedom Forum once a year, and you sit with these top dissidents and you keep hearing stories. And part of the stories is how the people overcome this type of obstacles. And I think one of the ways to deal with it is uh, looking at the non-political space. And I think when you look at the very close societies, Korean society, what is becoming very close society in Russia, it is actually the non-political space and state does not deliver topics. Because you, have, you look at these countries and you can look, for example, at Russia. There are like two great examples in the book. One, people were protesting against the election fraud in Moscow and in St. Petersburg. And because the cameras were there, people were allowed to protest. But of course, they couldn't file the protest in a little place like Barno, Siberia. So people came to this, this is 3,000 people place. This is like Grinnell in Iowa, like, you know, some really, really small village. And there is a square which is like this side, and then the people will build the little Lego city from the toys of their kids, and they will come out with the little Lego toys, and they will organize a toy protest. So the toys would run around with transparents and stuff like that. And of course, everybody would be there, people will tape it, they will post it on the YouTube, and you can see, my friend of mine made a documentary about this, and you can see that day one, there were even police taping it. So it's like everybody was you know, having fun. And then, of course, it went viral. And then somebody was really uproared about this in Kremlin. And they say, no, no, we need to prevent this. So next day, when the Russian activists file the, the request for the demonstrations, they got a written uh, a response from the police that the demonstration of 100 legal soldiers, 25 toy cars are banned <laughs> because the toys are not citizens of Russia. <laughs> and only citizens of Russia can protest. And th that was the official paper from the police. So now, now you look how the creativity and a little bit of bravery and a really cool idea can challenge the man who spent so much money in posing shirtless, wrestling tigers, saving dolphins from drowning. And, and, you know, diving out town for us. 
and he's afraid of toys. And it's like you, you, you can look at how the creativity always <laughs> find a way. So there is another, another Russian town, it's really cool. And there was a bunch of artists who were looking at the, at the city. And because, of course, the city is full of the bumps, these big holes in which you hit your car whenever you drive, mm -hmm. they kind of painted the faces of the city officials around this. So there will be a mayor with a big hole instead of his <laughs> mouth, and the governor with a big hole instead of his mouth. And of course, what happens in reality is that you drive the car, you hit the bump, and of course you curse. What else? And whom do you curse? And a really interesting response from the Russian officials was that they tried to repaint the faces <laughs> rather than fill the, the holes. holes. <laughs> So it's like this phenomenon, which I mean, the book is, 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 is of course, there is a chapter called Laugh Your Way to Freedom. The, the idea is that there are so many examples where people are super creative, operating on a high risk environment and using existing political space, and especially using humor and creativity, because humor is a very powerful weapon uh, ag against the politicians generally, not necessarily authoritarians. I, I have a sense that, that the people in power spend too much time watching their faces in the newspaper and on the TV and on billboards and start thinking about themselves as about this image rather than about their, their real selves. And they become very vulnerable to this type of activism, which we, of course, baptize the loftivism because this is what you do. So there are creative ways, there are small acts of resistance, there are activities which we call this dispersive tactics. Uh, Putins of this world will be very effective in preventing going you to the square. So you don't go to the square. You go somewhere where they don't expect you. So there are ways you can do it. There are like 200 different things people can do. And people are dealing it in the past. And I have a marvelous, like several uh, minutes ago, I spoke with Dan for your, for your this little podcast. And one of the things we say is where technology can help. And one of the great things that technology does, it helps group learn horizontally. So now you don't need a mentor, you don't need a trainer, you don't need a Harvard online course. You look at the how Venezuelans can make a small viral video, you make the one in Ukraine. Now the Taiwanese take it from there, they see it on YouTube, they record one themselves. So enabling people to learn horizontally from each other is I think the, the biggest achievement technology can bring to, to this world. And it's a, it's a great task of organizations like Google Ideas to make this space as open as possible and as available for the people as possible. Fantastic. Well, we have about 15 minutes left. So if there are questions that you all want to ask, we have microphones on the left and right hand side of the stage. Uh, and I'd ask that you ask the question from there so that we, because this whole thing is being recorded, uh, so that we can hear the question. So you all go to jail. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we know who's saying what. Uh, uh, Big and, brother is watching. So if, you, so if you'd uh, make your way to the mics, if not, I will continue the conversation. Uh, I think a couple of people are coming up. Um, Sergio, uh, yeah. back in the day, the technology. That sounds like we are about 250. It's, yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> but in 2000, you know, the internet in Serbia wasn't that terribly strong. Inter what? Yeah, right. Um, so uh, radio, radio. Uh, what was the big technology of the day? Just very quickly, and then Texting. we have questions. Texting. We, 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 would buy, we would go on a kiosk and buy this little prepaid phone card, and then you would go on a computer and send... Uh, 10,000 uh, messages. Uh, this is the day of the election. Milosevic is finished. Go out to vote and send this to everybody. And we thought this is the technology breakthrough of the 21st century. But the, the, it is always the technology you have available that you need to use. And however technology can be seductive and beautiful, you need to understand that you know it's like making a website in English wouldn't really mobilize the, the grannies in the rural Zimbabwe. Mm. So it's like the, the it's really understanding that that technology is a messenger for you rather than the essence. And you know it's like there were there were cases in the past where where young South African kids were trained to run from village to village and sing revolution because this is how they use their history. They they have a oral history. This is not something written in the books or in Vietnamese DVDs. 
This is, you know, the oral history. So you use the technology you have at your disposal. Some of this can be very cool and sexy, but don't get too obsessed with technology. Technology itself won't solve the problems. Only technology put in a good use is going to help and solve the problem, I think. Please. Hi, thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, I have a question around uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement, and um, I think that was a, 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 uh, an interesting example of nonviolent activism, but I don't think it was anywhere near as successful as uh, some people hoped it would be. And I'm wondering what lessons we could learn from that movement and uh, how they could then be applied perhaps in the future. Uh, that's a topic we discussed over and over, and, and uh, uh, the favorite topic of my co-writer of this book, who hides somewhere in a third rank. Matt, where are you? Say hi to everybody. And uh, we discussed this over and over, and we say, okay, that was a thrilling demonstration of necessity for social change in America. It was hitting the right topic of inequality. It was very nice in mobilizing the people, but the part of this book is very critical about it because the moment I sat with these people and I had the opportunity to meet them at the peak of their numbers because I was here teaching at NYU and they appear on a Todd Gitlin's class and he's a professor here in, in Colombia and he says, I want you to meet some cool people, they can make change. And it took me three hours speaking with them to extract the answer to the question, if you are the king for the day, if you're the Harry Potter, and you can touch America, how it will be different from today. And then they start telling me about the evil banks and evil this and evil that. And I said, no, 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 that's not the question. <laughs> the question is, if you are the king for the day, and every successful nonviolent struggle starts with the, the second chapter in the book is called Think Big, Start Small. What is the big picture? Where are you going? What is your vision of tomorrow? What do you want to achieve? And then how you are going to achieve this? If you can't give me the answer in this question in 30 seconds, why in the world would I follow you? So the, I think they, they were tremendously enthusiastic. I think uh, the space for this movement is here. You will see more pro-equality movements in this country in the next 10 years. I can put $100 on this bet. I don't know how they will be named, but one of the problems is they need to know what they want. Second and very important part of the story is branding the movement. I mean, if only these guys branded themselves 99%, then I can join. Because, you know, I have a wife, I have a small kids. I'm too busy doing other stuff to just sit in Sukoti Park. And I think it's like limiting yourself to a tactic is one of the mistakes movement make, which, of course, you're going to understand because you will read this book on your way home. So it's <laughs> You will understand exactly what I'm talking about. And next time you have an inequality problem, you will be far better equipped than, than Boys and Girls of Occupy. Thank you. One of the uh, interesting things that we probably don't have time to get into, and I want to get to the next question, but uh, Otpour as a movement, once it became successful, the leadership went through a big debate about do we become a political party? And uh, it was a fascinating conversation because their mission had been achieved. Uh, so I'm going to leave that aside for a second, but your question, please. Uh, thanks for this talk. It's really inspiring. Hearing actual facts about why nonviolence is more effective than violence is really, really useful and fascinating. I had a question that was opposite of the last question, I think, which was, if you're somewhere like, like North Korea, where dissent is so quashed and where there are no real means people can congregate and get together, how would you create some sort of social change somewhere like that? Uh, of course, there's always this theory that this will never work here because regime is too oppressive. I had a great conversation with some exiled North Koreans recently. And these are clever folks, and they understand the things. And you can look at the mobilization slash provocation tactics, which are recently executed by some North Korean uh, uh, exile guys. You can look at a brave friend of mine, Thor Haverson, who is crazy enough to you know, use balloons and send some content across the border, which I appreciate very much. And you can look at the long-term problem. And I think the long-term problem, how many of you are familiar with the, with the book or movie called 1984? Mm -hmm. It's okay, this is George Orwell, this is my, my little Bible. One of the things this movie tells you that the totalitarian regime tend to cut horizontal relationships between the people, within the families, within the community. So only look up to the great leader or whoever represents 
a great leader. I think the, the trick in North Korea and places like North Korea would be to start building small things. If you can organize a movement in the neighborhood which deals with question of garbage or whatever is mismanaged, and there's probably like 157 things which are mismanaged in the state of North Korea, and you can become successful on building on non-political issues. One of the things like tomorrow or day after tomorrow, the political will run an excerpt of this book, and they were fascinated with the story about the Harvey Milk. And that was not the story about the brave gay man who stood up for gay rights. That's a story about the brave gay man who was stupid enough to boost the elections three times, putting the topic of his sexuality. And then he understood that the thing he should build about is a dog's poop. And it is him being effectively persuading people of San Francisco that whether gay or straight, he is the person who is going to solve the problem of the dog's poop. And this is how he got elected. And this is exactly the grand lesson of the situation in places like North Korea. You pick the topic, you become successful around solving this topic. It's not the political topic, because if you try building around the political topic, you will end up in concentration camp. So this is a stupid way to go. The cool way to go is to look at the small things you can do, build this horizontal relationship. Once you're becoming successful, you're building a kind of the level of the success, more people will join, plus you're filling the space which is completely empty. The trademark of corrupted authoritarian regime is bad management. Traffic doesn't function, streets are full of the holes, nobody gets paid. I mean, you name it, you have it. And you're looking at these places because you can't protest politically, plus because it matters to the people so much more. You know, when you talk to the people from places like North Korea, they're far more concerned about what they are going to eat and then about the human rights or whatsoever. And I think one of the tricks that you will learn through reading this book is that the first step in organizing any nonviolent movement is go and listen to the people. And this is how you distinguish why the people will join the struggle. And this is when you understand that your mobilization force lies in the dog's poops of this world rather than the big idea of the free media and democracy and stuff like that, which we in the West, and I include Serbia in the West, tend to selfishly think that we know what they need. But we want to go and listen to what they need rather than that and help them build around what they need. At the end of the day, if they develop these horizontal relationships, they will gain power. And once they understand that they are powerful, then the regime will be in deep trouble from your lips to God's ears. All right, so why don't we take these last two questions together, so you and then uh -huh. you, and then you can answer them both, or not answer them at all, whatever you yeah. choose. Okay. Uh, hi, um, I also found the talk really fascinating, and I'm looking forward to getting stuck into your book on the subway in the mornings. Um, so my question is about, uh, in 2013, there was a big email leak, the Strat4 emails, which strongly suggested that you had a very close relationship with a company that uh, has reputation for being a very dodgy corporate security agency. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on your relationship with Strat4 and uh, how you think that relates to grassroots social democracy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and I'm going to try to put two questions what? there. I'm going to be cheeky. Uh, <laughs> f first one, you mentioned technology and horizontal sharing and so forth. How uh, given that governments and dictators and, and intelligence agencies are basically not only catching up, but are the leaders now in that technology world, do you think that will, that's going to hurt future revolutions? Mm. And the second one, maybe a bit closer to home, it seems that in former Yugoslavia, there is like a, that there's more popularity now for the parties that were in power in the 90s. Um, What's your view on that and, and mm. how that's going to impact the next five to ten years there? Okay, so uh, uh, let's start with the domestic issues. It's a normal process that uh, within the two or three electoral cycles, the old guys get elected. What I'm really thrilled about is that in my country, these people became electable only when they embraced the very values we were fighting for in 2000. So you look at the Otpor as a movement, and you say this movement was about uh, peace with neighbors, uh, being a part of the European Union and, uh, and uh, uh, of course, the, the very idea of democratic freedom of press, freedom of assembly, free and fair elections. 
it was when the parties who are now in power embraced these values that they became electable. And I think one of the things which distinguish uh, successful revolutions from successful turnovers not followed with successful transitions it is on what you focus. And if you're focusing like in Egypt on replacing Mubarak, then you maybe end up with Sisi, who is either same or worse as Mubarak. Where if we were building a struggle on the values, in terms of this is what we stand for, it is very likely that these values will prevail in the society, whoever sits on the top of the pyramid. Uh, on, the, on the topic of, of Stratford and Leaks, I've, I've done one presentation with these guys, which looks very much like, like this, though the venue was a little bit less fancy. And, uh, and I have a friend working there. And I think the, the big idea of evil secret services being around anything is exactly the, the public narrative we want to kill with this book. And I think the very obsession with conspiracy theories and the fact that, you know, Everybody believes that there is this super successful secret services who are pulling the strings everywhere and understand the stuff. They often can't find their own nose. So I mean, in, in my experience, uh, I would speak with about everybody. I will give a presentation to CIA. I will give a presentation to KGB. I would give the presentation to FSB. And I'll give the presentation to Google. If there is uh, one <laughs> single if there is one single person in the audience, I can persuade in an organization like Stratfor or CIA that it is the people who make the change, not the military. That this is the people you should invest into, uh, not elites. And the only way to do the durable change is, is actually to work with the people on the ground and appreciate the people on the ground and empower the people on the ground. I would rather do that. So I'm, I'm, that's my point of view is like, you know, uh, I will speak to the very devil in order to persuade the devil that, that uh, things should be changed. And last but not of least important is still this question of technology. And I spent 20 minutes speaking with Dan about this in a podcast. I will try to be fast. Modern technology is super effective in some kind of stuff. And there is this super cool guy called Clay Shirky, and you should watch his here comes everybody. He's very, very enthusiastic about how the technology can bring about the mobilization, and we had a great discussion about it. And I think technology does three things very well. Makes things faster, cheaper, more safe. B, it puts a huge price tag on the violence over the demonstrators, because even in a low-tech society like Bahrain, you see the demonstration, there's like 50 people taping. So it, would be very difficult to hide any, any kind of attempt to, to, to do something nasty. And last but not least important in my case, it enables you to learn. So where this is the horizontal learning, online learning, this enable activists to connect on the learning point. Also technology comes with a big price. First we get too obsessed. In technological world, as my co-writer Matt Miller would say, everything is about the shares and clicks. So if you have a really cool viral video where you're mocking your dictator and you get five million clicks, then you think that you're really on the top of the pyramid. And that brings you to the Kony 2012 campaign, which was probably the most successful public awareness rising online campaign ever. But Kony, where is Kony? He's in Uganda with his soldier's army. Okay, so when you're looking at the effects, effects should be made in the real world rather than being too obsessed with the effects in the virtual world, we call this phenomenon clicktivism. And I often say, okay, you know, I, I clicked on this page. I say one polar bear every day, like over my coffee. And, but, but the one which I really, really consider dangerous and, and dangerous misunderstanding, I think, is the phenomenon we call occupyism. It has nothing to do with the, with the social values of Occupy Wall Street. It has to do with a very, very stupid intention of the movements to copy paste most dangerous, most demanding, and very, very risky tactics of occupying symbolic public space. We could see this in Hong Kong. We want to protest, we must occupy. Why the hell we must occupy? There are so many other things we can do. We can whistle, we can hit pots and pans, we can wear symbols, we can organize parties, we can vote, we can do petitions. There's around 200 different things we can do instead of putting all of our pots into one place and waiting for police to come. 
Plus, if we repeat this every day, we become predictable. Plus, if we repeat this every day, well, where the people go to the toilet, the day seven. How this square is going to look the day nine? How the people will get thrilled once the rain starts? What about the rugby game? You know, so people don't think about it, they get too thrilled, but I think it's a seduction of the new media which enables you to gather your number too fast. It's like one thing is less you can assemble numbers quickly, but then if you assemble these numbers before you're ready, it's also a very, very big threat, not only because there will be five drunk idiots who will start throwing molotovs and destroy your beautiful demonstration, but because occupation is such a risky and demanding tactic, and you want this tactic not before you're ready, only at the end game, then you do the concentration tactic. Well, please uh, join me in thanking Sergio for his uh, talk today. Really appreciate it. I, I also would like uh, Sergio's co-author to stand up, and also uh, for the folks from uh, the folks from Oslo Freedom Forum who are here. Good. If you're here, please stand up. Would love to sit, congratulate Sarah, you, Alex. We love you. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Uh, again, uh, uh, Serge is somebody who, who we've known for a long time and has been really helpful in helping us think through some of the challenges that we uh, face and what we can do with our technology and our, our skills, abilities uh, to, to help in this cat and mouse game uh, that people like Serge face. So again, uh, we're up on the 15th floor. Come find us sometime. Mm. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. It was fun. It was fun.